Prometheus is a massive ocean liner that set off on a seven-day-long voyage four months ago. The entire ship and its 2,000 passengers have been missing since then. This has become a massive scandal in Europe because the first-class passengers of the ship were some well-known, important people. Rumors about what happened to the ship fly around the entire continent, but every attempt to find the ocean liner has failed. The opening scene shows us a woman named Mora running down the hallways of a mental asylum. She is running from her father, cursing him for doing something to her brother. Mora vaguely mentions a lost ship and accuses her father of killing many people. The ship she is talking about is Prometheus. In the following scene, Mora wakes up and assumes that she was only dreaming. However, the marks on her wrist that she got in the asylum say otherwise. Mora vaguely remembers what happened to her, but most of it is just a blur. It is almost as if someone erased the past few months from her memory. Currently, she is aboard another ship on her way to America from England. This ship is also on a seven-day journey and holds more than a thousand passengers. The people in first class are the high-class passengers, while those in the middle and working class are either refugees, criminals, or wanderers. They live in the lowest shared compartment and are given less to eat, while the first-class passengers are served the finest delicacies of the world. What no one knows is that every passenger on board has a secret they are hiding. First class is probably hiding that they're a bunch of a-holes. Mora is one of the first-class passengers and is here because she received a letter a few days ago. The letter was from her brother. In it, he is asking Mora to come to New York, asserting that he knows what their father has done. This is the very reason Mora is aboard the ship, even though she is in bad health and mentally unstable. Mora looks into the mirror and reminds herself what her name is so she won't forget if someone tries talking to her. In the dining area are a recently married couple, Lucian and Laura. Because the marriage was an arrangement by their parents, they don't love each other. Lucian instead has an eye for a Japanese prostitute on board. Meanwhile, the said prostitute is with her mother, dressed in traditional Japanese kimono, but speaking Cantonese. It turns out that they are pretending to be Japanese for a better life abroad. Mora is sitting alone when a woman named Miss Eve sits beside her. Eve is the owner of the prostitute and is taking her to America to sell her to a brothel. Mora gets annoyed as Eve gets intrusive with her questions, but the two are interrupted by the arrival of a man. He is a lowly worker from the lower class who is not allowed to even look at the first class passengers. He asks if there is a doctor on board because his sister is dying in the lower compartment. The man is taken away by the guards, but Mora follows them, revealing that she is a practicing doctor. And because the male doctors on board are stuffing their fat faces with gruel. She goes to the lower compartment and helps the pregnant woman. The people are skeptical, but her little sister trusts Mora. When the woman stops hurting, Mora's expertise is proven, and she quietly comes outside. This is when she meets the captain of the ship. He lost his wife and daughters in a house fire two years ago, and is still mourning their deaths. The captain talks to Mora for a while before they are interrupted by his assistants. They reveal that they have been getting a signal from somewhere nearby that shows them the coordinates of a place. The captain has reasons to believe the signal is coming from the lost ship. To investigate, he disregards the passengers and turns the ship around. Mora goes to talk to the captain and inquires if he thinks anyone on the lost ship might still be alive since they were gone for four months. The captain knows it is unlikely, but hopes that they rationed out their food and survived. After Mora leaves, the captain brings out an envelope, similar to the one she received from her brother. This one is from someone named Isle. A while later, the captain addresses the situation with the first-class passengers and tells them he is turning the ship to get to the coordinates. Most of them are not happy about the decision, but the captain remains adamant. A few hours later, they finally reach the coordinates and confirm that it is indeed the lost ship. The captain orders his assistants to lower a lifeboat and chooses a group to accompany him to the lost ship. The group consists of two lower class men, Olek and Jerome, Mora, and a few more people to keep watch. When they finally reach the lost ship and climb up, they are shocked to see no one. Not even a dead body is lying anywhere, and the entire ship seems to be abandoned. The captain is especially confused about how they received the signal because the device used to do so is destroyed. Suddenly, Mora notices a beetle moving on the floor and follows it. The insect leads her to a room near a locked cupboard. Mora carefully opens it and is shocked when a little boy comes outside. He doesn't speak or show any emotions, but he is holding a strange pyramid. Questions about his survival linger around the group before they 
bring him to their boat. Mora agrees to keep him safe in her room and to take care of him since she is a doctor. That night, a man who seems to have swam over from the lost ship secretly boards the Kerberos. The following morning, every compass on the ship stops working. People question if they will suffer the same fate as the passengers of the lost ship, and even the captain doesn't know what to do next. Meanwhile, Mora is busy taking care of the kid. She returns to her room with food for him and finds a stranger standing outside her door. It appears to be the man who boarded from the lost ship. The man quickly shifts to another door and explains that he heard whimpers from her room and simply wanted to check up on her. He also introduces himself as Daniel, her neighbor. Mora asks the man if they have met before because he seems familiar, but he dismisses the conversation and walks into his room. After that, Mora asks the kid what he was doing on the ship. However, the boy remains silent and hands her the pyramid he was found with. It seems like he is trying to communicate something with her, but she can hardly interpret it. Meanwhile, the captain assumes that everything with the lost ship has to do with the ship company. Before the voyage, he received a letter from the company that had only two words, sink ship. He thinks that the company wants them to sink the recently found ship to hide their misdeeds. His staff thinks that he is thinking too much. The captain is asked to make up his mind about what he wants to do now. The passengers and even his own crew are beginning to question his authority because the ship hasn't moved. In such conditions, his mental health deteriorates and he starts hearing the sound of his daughter singing. Following the sound, he reaches the room where his wife and daughters died. It is revealed that the house fire that killed them was not an accident, but was set by his own wife to kill her daughters and her self. The captain probably should have played Django with them more often, or uh, whatever people did back then. The captain tries talking to his family, but his wife ignores him and takes the kids away, leaving only his eldest daughter behind. The girl tells her father to come back and lights on fire. This brings the captain back to reality. However, when he opens his eyes, he finds himself inside a compartment under his bed. He is shocked because he knows every corner of the ship, but was unaware of the compartment right under his own bed. At that moment, the captain decides that he is taking the lost ship to the shore, no matter what. Since they lack enough coal to drag it to America, they will have to return to England. Somewhere else, Mora finds a tattoo on the boy's neck that is similar to the mark on the envelope she received. She reveals to the kid that her brother has been missing for the past four months, and she had no clue where he was before she received the letter. The mark is very important to her, and she wants the kid to explain what it means. The boy listens to everything and starts crying, but still doesn't say a word. When Mora leaves, her neighbor Daniel comes outside her door again. This time, he lets out a beetle from his palm, similar to the one that was found on the lost ship. It turns away from the door and walks down the hallway. A little girl from the lower class passengers finds it, follows it, and bumps into Daniel. He apologizes to her, and the scene cuts abruptly. Somewhere else, the captain tells the passengers that they are going back to England, and nobody's happy about it. People start to protest, but he goes against everyone and remains adamant in his decision. Mora follows him to the deck and asks him what is going on. The captain tells her about the sink ship message, sent by the ship's company. He also assumes that he and Mora were sent on the ship for a reason, having known about the letter she received that was similar to his. Later, the dead body of the little girl is found, and a male doctor is called to find out the cause of her death. He carelessly declares that she died of natural causes because she was sick. Mora questions his credibility, but the man shows her no respect. The only thing this guy's got a PhD in is sexism. Suddenly, the captain is called outside to see the fog they are surrounded by. Till now, they were using the sun to figure out the direction they were going. However, with the fog covering them, the direction is difficult to navigate. The captain returns to his room with Mora and shows her a piece of ribbon that belonged to his daughter. He also discloses that he found the ribbon on the lost ship. He believes that his family was on that ship, even though they have been dead for a long time. Mora and him decide to go back to the lost ship once again to check the captain's logs and find out more about what happened there. They go to lower the lifeboat but are stopped by the head of security on the way. He is very unhappy with the captain's decision to return to England and thinks his obsession with the lost ship will harm them all. Still, the captain ignores his words and continues lowering the boat. After they leave, the head of security and the captain's second in command decides to rally people against him. Yar, it's time for a mutiny, boys. The head of security goes to the lower class people and tells them about the little girl's death. He pins them against the captain and tells them to protest. Since the lower class people do not have enough money to get a ship ticket for a second time, they don't want to return to England. A while later, they find three more dead people on the ship. 
who seem to have died as the little girl did. This fills them with rage, and people get ready to fight for their rights. Somewhere else, the captain and Mora reach the lost ship and go through a room. They find that every official paper has been burnt in the fireplace, but the captain manages to get a single unburnt piece of paper out. It has the list of passengers aboard the ship. They also come across a strange electric board attached to a wall. The captain reveals that it is a new addition to the ship that happened last year and is used to measure the steam pressure. It suddenly hits him that the instrument is basically useless, which means it must be there for something else. He is scared for his passenger's life because their ship also has the same instrument. This further proves his theory that the ship company has something to do with the lost ships and the dead people. To make matters even more confusing, the captain sees that Mora's name is on the missing ship's manifest. Then, we see the Japanese prostitute looking over the sea. The married man, Lucian, approaches her and tries to start a conversation, but the prostitute walks away to avoid him. The interaction doesn't go unnoticed by her owner, Eve. She comes to Lucian with a proposal and agrees to let him spend the night with the prostitute for a lot of money. Later, Eve checks the prostitute to ensure she is clean and finds out that she is actually a virgin. A flashback shows us that her mother used to work in a brothel. One day, the best prostitute got an opportunity to work abroad and get a better life. The women were jealous, so they killed the said girl and took her place on the ship. The virgin prostitute knows that what they did was wrong, and she accepts her fate by agreeing to sleep with Lucian. The night comes, and Lucian lies to his wife about wanting to sleep in another room. We see him avoiding taking his medicine. Because of this, he gets a seizure right before the prostitute takes off her clothes. We find out that Lucian is taking medicine for these seizures, but if he takes it, it makes him impotent. Bit of a catch-22 there. Upon returning back to their ship, the captain looks at the paper he found. He is shocked to see Mora's name on the passenger list of the lost ship. This means that she was also on it, but the captain has no answers for how she returned and what secrets she is hiding. In the following scene, Daniel meets Mora and asks her how she feels about the captain. Mora finds the question strange, but she says that she trusts him with her life because he has been through a lot and wants the best for his passengers. Meanwhile, the people of the lower class start gathering guns and weapons, determined to take over the ship and get it to America. Before the captain is warned, he is surrounded by rivals. Simultaneously, we see Daniel trying to use the strange machine that the captain saw on the other ship earlier. The captain and three of his supporters are locked into a cabin with their hands bound. The chief security then finds out that the compass has started working again. Upon checking their location, the crew is shocked to realize that they are in the same exact position that they were three days ago when they initially deviated from the course. Even the oldest members of the crew have no explanation for this, because they have been moving continuously since they were last in this position. In the meantime, the protesters surround a staff member and ask him to tell them why their people are dying. In fear, the man recounts everything that has happened on the ship since they received the signal from the ghost ship. When the group finds out this happened after the kid was rescued, they blame the deaths on him. Assuming that he brought a disease, the protesters roar in anger and set off to look for the kid and kill him. First, they go into Mora's room but find it empty. After looking around and confirming the kid is not there, they lock Mora in and walk away to check the other rooms. As Mora grows worried for the boy, she hears a noise from under her bed. She moves it to take a look and finds a hidden compartment, similar to the one under the captain's bed. The boy comes out of the compartment, looking like a little demon, and Mora breathes a sigh of relief. One after another, the protesters lock the high-class passengers into their rooms. Mora tries picking her lock as the kid watches her struggle. Then, he brings out a beetle, and the insect magically unlocks locks the door from outside. Mora is stunned, but she doesn't have enough time to dwell on the matter. They run to the lifeboat and reunite with the captain and his supporters. It turns out that he escaped the room they were locked in by crawling into a vent. Currently, the group is planning to run away in the lifeboat. Mora tries joining them, but the captain is skeptical. After having seen her name on the passenger list of the ghost ship, before the group can lower the lifeboat, the protesters arrive and take the little boy away to be killed. It starts raining heavily as they get ready to sacrifice the kid, and I don't blame them, he looks like the thing from the omen. However, he doesn't seem scared, almost as if he has accepted his fate. Seconds before they slice his throat, the captain and his supporters come to his aid. A fight ensues between the two parties and many people are injured. Mora does her best to get to the kid, but a woman throws him off the ship before she can. A while later, the captain's group takes care of their injuries in the lobby. Mora is still shocked and horrified because she had grown a connection to the little boy during the time they had spent together. Having had enough, the captain calls Mora out for 
for playing dumb and shows her the names on the lost ship's passengers list. Mora is shocked because she doesn't remember being on the ship at all. She tries to discredit the paper but stops when the cupboard nearby makes a noise. Everyone watches in shock as the little boy comes out of the cupboard, holding the strange pyramid as he did on the lost ship. The episode ends when he walks up to Mora and hugs her. To see what happens next, watch the second part in series recapped.